Shalom and welcome to this week's um, uh, lecture and it's entitled Healing the World, Working a Mystical Approach. Okay, this is um, uh, obviously we're doing this because of the uh, the pandemic that we're all going through and um, I'm going to share with you about that in a moment. So uh, one of the greatest paradigms that any human being can have is the paradigm of I can make a difference. This and this alone is the Torah perspective always. Yes, I am aware of the universal serenity prayer in asking for the serenity for the things that we cannot change and for the wisdom to know which those things are. However, notice that the serenity prayer uses the words change, that which I can change, while I use the words make a difference. Even when I cannot change something, how I respond to it and what I do about it makes a difference. Take, for example, the lady Candace Leitner, who founded MAD, Mothers Against Drunk Driver, Drunken Driver, after her 13-year-old daughter, Carrie, was killed by a drunk driver. Well, on the one hand, without finding some form of acceptance and serenity in the fact that there is nothing she can do to bring her daughter back to life, Candace would be stuck in painful paralysis, crippling any semblance of life. On the other hand, look at what a difference Candace made in the world with something that she could not change. In Jewish belief, and especially in Jewish mystical belief, there is nothing in our lives that leaves us incapable of making a difference. It begins with understanding the spirituality of what we are experiencing and taking it straight to our relationship with God. This does not negate physical, practical, and medical responses and precautions. However, this takes us beyond those physical responses, giving us a possibility to make a universal difference through taking spiritual actions as well. And so it is with the present COVID virus, sorry, um, uh, COVID-19 uh, pandemic. Torah mandates that first and foremost, we must, we must take medical and social precautions and responses. However, as a people of faith in God and in God's sovereignty of the world, we mustn't stop there, but rather then go on to take spiritual steps to make a difference as well. This lecture will explore ailment and healment in, on a mystical level with the practical steps that this spirituality asks us to take. This lecture is based primarily on two mystical teachings of the Rebbe Blessed Memory delivered on the verse in Jeremiah, Heal me, O Lord, then I shall be healed. Help me, then I shall be helped for you are my praise. One discourse the Rebbe delivered in 1961 and the other in 1964, exploring the mystical dimensions of ailment and healment. Okay, an introduction. Our sages teach us that the Torah is the blueprints that God created and that God used to create the world. Even more so, the Ten Commandments are the life force of the Ten Utterances in Genesis with which God created the world. Genesis tells us that God used utterances to create the world. And God said, let there be light. And God said, ten times it says that. So the Ten Commandments are the life force of the Ten Utterances with which God created the world. And on top of this, the Torah is called Torah Chaim the Torah of life, as we say in our evening prayers, based on a verse in Deuteronomy, for they, words of Torah, are our life. Now, the mystical meaning to this is that the Torah is life. It is the vitality of the world. More specifically, studying a specific portion of the Torah brings the specific strengthening of the specific Torah teaching into the world. 
And thus, one of the many actions of Chabad worldwide in response to the COVID-19 pandemic is to study the two teachings of the Rebbe on the verse in Jeremiah, Heal me, O Lord, then shall I be healed. Heal me, then I shall be held, for you are my praise. We do this in order to draw the healing powers of God into the world. Okay, let's begin with two questions on the verse. Question number one, why the double language of heal me, O Lord, then shall I be healed? The same question applies to the next phrase in the verse, help me, then I shall be helped. Why the double language? Question number two, the words for you are my praise denote that the reason for heal me is because for you are my praise. How is this a reason for heal me? How would God being my praise be the reason I'm giving God to heal me? Okay, now let's start the lecture. As you know, I always start with, you know, a list of the mystical concepts that we're going to explore and then wrap it up in practical understanding of our modern day situation. So here's the list. Number one, understanding the potential of ailment. Number two, understanding the process of creation. Number three, understanding the process of healing. And then finally, why do we praise God? And let the amazement of Hasidus begin. Okay, number one, understanding the potential of ailment. In order to understand the mysticism of healing, we will first have to understand the mysticism of ailment. If ailment exists in the physical world, then it must be that there is the spiritual concept of ailment from which the physical ailment is brought into being. Thus, let us look into the verse in Jeremiah just previous to our verse of healing. And this is what Jeremiah says. For they have forsaken the source of living waters, the Lord. Okay, here too, let's ask two questions. Number one, why the parable of the source of living waters? You could have just said, for they have forsaken God. Number two, why the closing with the specific ineffable tre tetragrammaton name of the yud Hey vav Hey, sometimes written in English as Y-H-W-H. In order to understand this, let us examine the mystical process of creation. Okay, let's understand the process of creation. In Kabbalah and Hasidus, we are taught that the process of creation is a three-part process. Revelation, concealment, revelation. This is why in some teachings, we explain the entire evolution of creation as the existence of what Kabbalah calls the four worlds. The four worlds are, one, atzilut, which means near, drawn forth. The second world is called Bria, creation, ex nihilo. The third world is called Yetzira, formation, a formed identity of self. And the fourth world is Asiya, action, coarse ego. Now, in the all encompassing general evolution of creation, Atsilut, the world of absolute divinity, refers to the primordial, the pre-contraction infinite light, which is total revelation. I know I'm sounding Kabbalistic, don't get lost. Trust me, for those who have known me from before, everything will make practical sense. But I do want to lay out the pieces, the Kabbalistic pieces of what we're talking about. So the first step is the primordial, the infinite light before contraction, total revelation. Then came the great contraction, Tsimtsum. What is this about? In order for the world to be finite and to obtain its own identity of somethingness outside of just experiencing self as part and parcel of the oneness of God, God contracted and concealed his infinite light. Step two, concealment. Now I want to just explain this a little more. This actually took place in two stages. The first stage is that the light of Atsilut, the total world and realm of divinity, descends into the world of Bria, creation. And thus, even though the world of Bria is defined as an ex, ex nihilo, 
ex Latin for something, meaning that it experiences a separated identity from the oneness of God. The Kabbalistic definition for concealment is to be separated from God. Nevertheless, it is imbued and experiences the nihilo, ex nihilo. Nihilo is the Latin word for nothingness, which Kabbalistically, nothingness, believe it or not, refers to God. Why? Because God defies any definition, parameters, and properties of what we would call a something. Thus, the realm of Bria, which is ex nihilo, something from nothing, it's atzilut, divinity that's bringing Bria into existence, it's still considered as part of the revelation. It is the world of Yetzirah, the next world, that the true darkness begins. Being a something, Yetzira, from a something, Berea, it's not ex nihilo, it's ex ex, something from something. It knows and experiences nothing but the darkness of ego and separation from God. This is the second stage of creation called concealment. So we have step number one, the world of Atzilut, primordial, infinite light, that's revelation. Then we have the creation of the world and formation of identity and separation from divinity, the oneness of God, and that is called concealment. Now, here is the big question to be asked. The next realm in the world is our physical world, Asiya. Now, if revelation is defined by a total transparency too, and a conscious experience of being but of the oneness of God. How can we call our world the final stage of creation as revelation? Our world seems to be the ultimate world of narcissism, the ultimate world of self-identity, separation from God. How can we say that our world is that of revelation? The answer is, that God gave specifically to our physical world his primordial Torah and mitzvot. Therefore, through Torah study and through mitzvot observance, we draw the ultimate revelation of God's sovereignty and God's oneness precisely into our physical world. Within the Torah and mitzvot, is where God has placed his infinite will, his infinite wisdom, and his very essence. Thus, Torah is called Torah or the Torah of light, for it is the revelation of God's oneness, which encompasses all of existence and creation. Thus, our physical world, through Torah study and mitzvah observance, is the final stage of creation which is the revelation of God. Now let us return to the verse in Jeremiah in which he describes ailment. For they have forsaken the source of living waters, the Lord. Let's see what this means from what we're understanding. Concealment of God within creation is what gives potential to sickness. Concealment. Our world Absence of Torah study and mitzvah observance is the ultimate experience of opaque separation and coarse narcissism and self-centeredness. Without Torah mitzvot, our world and our experience of self is that of ultimate concealment and thus the ultimate breeding ground of sickness. Jeremiah is telling us that it is our forsaking of the source of living waters that has brought us to need of, to the need of, heal me, O Lord, then shall I be healed. Within the revelation and the experience of the oneness of God, there is no sickness. And in our coarse world of ego, Torah and mitzvot are the gateway to this revelation and experience. So now let's understand the process of healing. The process of healing is the process of teshuvah, repentance, returning to God. 
through his Torah and mitzvot. Before we explain how to do teshuvah, I want to explain the process of teshuvah, which is the process of healing. For this, let us return to our two questions on Jeremiah's verse explaining the ailment. Question number one, why the parable of the source of living water? For they have forsaken the source of the living water. He just says, for they have forsaken God, for they have forsaken your Torah. Question number two, why the closing with the specific and effable tetragrammaton name of God, which is the yud Hey vav Hey, the Y-H-W-H, why that? Now, in order to understand what Jeremiah is specifically referring to with his analogy of source of living water, we will have to turn to a verse of King Solomon that explains the water system of our planet. Now, the simple definition of source of living water always refers to well water. So, King Solomon says in Ecclesiastics chapter 1, verse 7, and I quote, All the rivers flow into the sea, yet the sea is not full. To the place where the rivers flow, there they repeatedly go. Now, here is a simple question. If it is the waters of the ocean that pour back into the rivers, then why aren't the waters salty just like the water, the ocean waters? As a matter of a fact, river waters are quite sweet. Believe it or not, Kabbalah and Hasidus want to understand this. The answer that Hasidus gives is that the ocean waters seep into the ground and then through the water veins within the ground, it breaks through and emerges in wells. This process of the ocean waters traveling through sand, earth, and rocks, cleanse and filter the waters so that they aren't any more salty and undrinkable, but rather they are now crystal clear and sweet. What does this mean to us on a mystical level? If Hasidus and Kabbalah is explaining this, it wants to explain to us something on the mystical level. So here goes. The original revelation of the infinite light represents the ocean waters. And as great and as mighty as it may be, it is salty and undrinkable, so to speak. It is precisely through the descent into our physical world, earth, sand, and rocks, by us doing the physical Torah study and mitzvot, that the infinite light becomes crystal clear, sweet, and drinkable, so to speak. In other words, our experience of the infinite light through our Torah study and mitzvah observance is even a greater experience than the primordial infinite light. This is through Torah study and mitzvot observance. However, now let us see what happens when we have forsaken Torah and mitzvot temporarily and thereafter turn to Shuva. Nehemiah, Nehemiah in chapter 9, verse 6 states, You alone are the Lord, you made the heavens, the heavens of the heavens, and all their hosts, the earth and all that is upon it, the seas and all that is in them, and you give life to them all. That's a verse in Nehemiah. Now, Kabbalah and Hasidus, in explaining this verse, state the following. The ultimate experience in the world of divinity is the experience and conscientiousness of you alone are God, above and beyond the you made heavens. Higher than knowing that God made heavens and heavens of heavens and earth and gives everything life is to know that you, God, you alone are the Lord. However, even here, the very notion that we feel the need to say are alone. In other words, we want to eliminate a thought. We're saying, no, 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 you, Lord, are alone, is already telling us that this is not the highest experience of God. In other words, this is still the experience of the infinite light shining and not the essence of God in his simple beingness. Thus, while through our physical Torah and mitzvot study and mitzvot observance, we are connecting and experiencing the you are the Lord alone. Nevertheless, 
it is through Teshuvah that we experience the source of living water, the essence of God himself. Not the infinite light shining, but the source of the infinite light. So while Torah and Mitzvot bring us the essence, the infinite light shining, but Teshuvah takes us a step higher into the source of the living water, the essence of God himself. Thus the verse closes with specific ineffable tetragrammaton name of God, the yud heh vav -Hey. Why? In Genesis, the, verse, the verses repeatedly use the name Elohim, as in, in the beginning, Elohim created the heavens and the earth. Elohim in Kabbalah is the name of contraction and concealment, which is why it's being used in the process of creation. However, the ineffable tetragrammaton, the name yud heh vav -Hey, is called the essence name. Now we understand what Jeremiah is telling us. Through Teshuvah, we connect to the source of living water, the essence name, the essence of God himself. However, how is it that we, especially after the temporary forsaking of the Torah mitzvot, can connect, experience, and draw the very essence of God himself into our lives and into the world? Because that's what healing is all about. That's what the shuva is all about. But how? How can we do it? So the answer is that the empowerment for teshuva must first come from above, from God. And only after this can we then go on to do our teshuva below with all our heart, mind, thoughts, speech, and action. Thus, the double language of Jeremiah's verse of healing. Heal me. What that means is, God, empower me from above to do teshuva. Then he goes on to say, O oh Lord, then shall I be healed. What this means is that once you heal me from above, you empower me to do teshuva, I will be able to do teshuva here below with all our heart, mind, thoughts, speech, and actions. So it all begins with the heal me. You, God, I need your help. I need you to empower me to do what you want me to do. I need you to empower me to turn back to you. And once you empower me, then I will be able to go on and do my part. Let us now explore the last thing, the reason for healing that Jeremiah gives. He says, for you are my praise. Now, Hasidus wants to know, why is it that in our prayers we are consistently praising God? Of what purpose is there to praise God? Yeah, it's nice, of course, it makes sense, but what purpose? What is the accomplishment of me praising God in my prayers? The answer is that through stating, we draw forth that which lay hidden within. It's the power of the word. Simply speaking, between humans, by calling someone compassionate, we actually draw forth their compassion. And by calling someone angry, mean, etc., the power of the word actually arouses the emotion or trait of the person we are speaking to. Now, on the deeper mystical level, the power of praise is especially effective when speaking of the omnipotent, infinite, abstract, and non-relatable qualities of our infinite teacher, God. The reason why we pray God we praise God is because through the power of the word of praise, we draw forth that which is hidden beyond the power of revelation. This is the, I'm sorry, there is the infinite gap between the infinite and the finite, and even between the essence and the infinite light. How can we draw forth that which is hidden within he himself, so to speak? This is the power of the word of praise. Thus, Jeremiah is in asking for the heal me, essence power of teshuva from above, states that the reason we can do this is because of the power of praise. For you, your essence, O God, are my praise. By praising God, the words of praise, the power that God gave into the word is to draw forth from the other, the emotion, the trait, 
especially that which is so deeply hidden within the other. So too with God. By praising God, by the words of praise, we are drawing forth the essence power of healing, the essence power of God to do teshuva. So in closing, so now in closing, let's be practical about the infinite powers of God. Now, this is a kind of an oxymoron, practical about the infinite powers of God. So let's see. In general, when we speak of the supernal, and especially when we start speaking about the infinite, and even more so when we speak of the essence, we get kind of disconnected. Okay, what does the rabbi want from me? However, in this teaching, we are being taught that what is being asked of us is first and foremost to humbly and simply say the words of praise to God in asking God to give us the power to do practical teshuva, in turning to God, to Torah, to prayer, and to mitzvot, inviting God into our lives. We are being guided to say words of praise and trust of God's healing powers. Now, this isn't hard nor impractical. However, it does demand a simple humility of accepting that we are but fragile, finite beings standing before God, asking of God to help us. So let's stop for a moment. Let's just turn to God, speak of God as the compassionate, loving Father who empowers me regardless of what I have done in my life, to turn to him, to connect with him, to draw the essence of God into this world that is struggling with sickness and fear and anxieties. Just by praising God, you, God, are my compassionate, omnipotent power who unconditionally loves me, your creation, all beings. Just this empowers us to be able to bring God's healing powers into our lives and into our worlds. May into our world, may God truly bring this pandemic to an end. May whatever we are to grow from this happen easily and speedily. God bless you all and protect you all and please stay safe.